And yours too. BJ, because yours would probably work. Is BJ on? Oh, we, could, we didn't get the email, so you oh. can't. Is he on or not? No. Also. Also, udah link yang ke Dr. Vijay udah dikirim. Dr. Vijay belum. As the Dr. Vijay Roach link is already sent to his email address. Oh, he already sent it last night. Yeah, he yes. said he didn't receive it. He, he didn't receive it. If you could send it again to him. Send it again. Send it again. One more. Satu. Satu berapa? Send it again. One thousand. YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can help us, Udi, to contact Dr. PJ. I'll just forward him my invite. That's fine. Thanks, so far. <laughs> One minute. One minute to go, I think. You want to start? Sending him yours? For the lovely Australian people, Salamat Siang is good afternoon, okay? <laughs> okay, everybody, I think now it's already 12 o'clock. So welcome, Vijay. Ah, hello, Professor Wirkad. See you. Good, good afternoon, everyone. So please welcome to the very first Pogi Lunch Cop uh, joint conference that is uh, conducted right now, Thursday, 2nd July 2020. Uh, we have uh, two hours joint webinar conference between Pogi and Ranskov. Of course, we are very pleased to conduct these very beautiful sessions with our international college from Royal Australia New Zealand's College of Obstetric and Gynecologists. And this is one of our agenda and goals, uh, implementation of collaboration, international collaboration between Pogi and Ranskov. So for this today webinar Congress, uh, we will have four distinguished guest speaker, both of from uh, two from Ranskov and then two from Pogi, and also there is a brief presentation regarding the, our program for international affiliation membership of Pogi to Ranskov that will be presented by Shudi Sika. So from uh, for the start, uh, before we start this congress. I will let you know the, the agenda, our agenda today. Uh, it will start with welcome address from both of the presidents, from Dr. Fijay Rose from uh, Ranskok and then Dr. Ari Kusuma Janualto from Pogi. And then after that, afterward, the first speaker from Australia, Professor Annabelle, will talk about cervical cancer prevention, followed by second speaker, Dr. Andon, will talk about PCOS, and then we continue with Q&A. And afterward, uh, Mr. Sudi will present about Pogi Ranskok affiliate membership. And then after this, we have third speaker, Julie Hamblin, will talk about reparative rights. And then the last speaker from Indonesia, Professor Eli Gumilar, will talk about reclamsia. And then we close with the Q&A again. And also closing remark from uh, me as a host. So for the first agenda, we invite Dr. Fijay Roach from uh, as a president of Transcorp to give the welcome remark. Please, Vijay. 
Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Vijay Roach. Namasaya Vijay. I am the president of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Sayadari Australia. <laughs> Selamat Sore. Assalam Aliakum. On Swasti Astu. Senang Batumi Dengan Anda. Saya Senang. My Bahasa is not very good. <laughs> so I mainly want to say Terima Kasi Banyak. Thank you, Professor Waweko, Professor Hadasputra, Professor Ari Kusama. Thank you for working with the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists with Australia and New Zealand to develop a relationship between our organisations, between our countries and between our people. I'm glad that we have signed the Memoranda of Understanding that we have developed the international affiliate membership of Ranscog, that we have plans for educational programs for exchange of ideas between our three countries, between our organizations. But most importantly, I am very grateful for the opportunity of friendship because I think that underpins everything that we do. We will have a strong professional relationship and a strong intercollegial relationship but eating together, spending time together, having a better understanding of each other's cultures and families and communities, I think is something that will only enhance our professional and personal lives. So I wish everybody every success today. I'd uh, express my gratitude to our speakers for giving their time and for putting in so much effort into their preparation. Thank you to the Indonesians for organizing the webinar and for hosting us. And I look forward to hearing the speakers and to joining in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vijay. Of course, thank you very much as well for your uh, great warm welcome address from Australia and also uh, the friendly of, uh, warm from Ranskop. Yeah, it's very interesting that we should uh, collaboration, make a collaboration hand in hand, not only in scientific, but also maybe uh, in other fields. Yeah, we have uh, many uh, different culture, different background, the social background. And then I think this is the very potential to have a collaboration between Indonesia and Australia. Thank you very much. And the next we invite uh, the President Pogi, Dr. Arif Sumajan Nuarto to give your welcome remarks. Please, Dr. Ari. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Uh, my honorable for the president of Ransok, Dr. Vijay, I am respect to your greeting with the Indonesian court. Uh, <laughs> uh, for the Professor John Figos and you go for the my honorable my spe speaker from the Ransok, Dr. Annabel. Dr. Julie, uh, Dr. Sudi, thank you. And my Indonesian OBGI and Collegium Chairperson, Professor Wahyu, my General Secretary, Prof. Budi Weko, and my President elect from Indonesia, Dr. Yudi, please join for the, uh, this conference. Professor in my college, I am pleased to welcome you to first Pogi and Razok joint conference. I would like to thank to Professor John Vigos, who had initiated this collaboration with first start with Indonesian OBGN Association, uh, Belly Brands, Surabaya Brands, and Malang Brands. Thank you, Dr. Prof. John Vigos. And the collaboration has then officially marked in May. Uh, 16, 2019, by signing of mobile, uh, memorandum of understanding between Indonesian Collegium in uh, Indonesian Obsidian Association, Pogi and Transfer. The MOB, MOU represents opportunity that bring mutual benefit, not just for INACOP or Ranscop as organization, but also individual member. 
for POGI member, this collaboration will give opportunity to register as the Ransom International Affiliate Membership. The MOU will cover area collaboration such as staff capacity building and development, exchange of academy and advertising expertise, research support, sharing the teaching research and curriculum, uh, support approved student uh, attachment and teachers, and collaboration research, lecture, and symposium like this day. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, the COVID-19 pandemic situation has forced us to seek for new way in our activity, not just in daily practice as OBGYN, but also in how we can keep improving our knowledge with the support or information technology by conducting serial video conferencing like what we do today. I am grateful to the many experts who practice to share this knowledge today. I also welcome the many participants from Indonesia and Australia and New Zealand who joined the conference. I am sure you will have fruitful and rewarding exchange in the conference. Last but not least, I wish you every success with the important conference and I look forward to learning about the outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ari Kusuma, Januarto, as a president of POGI. I think he's addressed about uh, our good willingness between us that uh, we are, we are really, really sure that this event will we have, uh, we have, uh, will gain a lot of experience that uh, very important to improving our professionalism, our competencies in making good quality of reproductive health services in both of country, particularly in Indonesia. Welcome also to Professor Wahyu Harisaputra as the president of Indonesian College ONG and also Dr. Yudi Hidayat as the president-elect of Indonesian uh, Society of ONG or POGI. And also Professor John Figos, he is a pioneering, pioneering of uh, collaboration between Pogi and Ranskop in 2002, which is the first, very first national exam in Indonesia, uh, which was attended by Professor John Figos and Professor Bilan Afandi at the time. So without further ado, uh, I will introduce the first speaker in this session. Uh, she is a... Uh, Professor Annabelle uh, Farnsworth. Professor Annabelle will talk about preventing cervical cancer in 2020. She is a fellow of Royal College of Pathology of Australia. And right now, she is a director of cytology and cervical screening at Douglas Henry Moore Pathology in Sydney. And she's also a professor of pathology at the Sydney Medical School of the University of Notre Dame. I think uh, many uh, study were already done and also many international publication in a peer review journal is already published uh, with, uh, by her. And of course, her interest uh, is about population screening, including cervix, lower genital tract, cytology, and human papilloma virus. So, Professor Annabelle, yeah. the time okay. is yours. Okay. okay. So I hope my screen has come up. Have you got my presentation? Yes. yes. Okay. 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 So <laughs> um, I must say um, it is just such an honour to have been invited to speak at this um, obviously inaugural uh, seminar and it's an obviously an, um, an impressive and wonderful collaboration between Indonesia and Australia. I am still a little bit astounded by this technology and um, obviously with the horrible pandemic that we're all dealing with internationally, it has given a great deal of impetus for us to learn how to use it. So um, I do hope that this um, all works accordingly. I've got 15 minutes today. What I thought I would like to do is basically talk about uh, how we've approached preventing cervical cancer in Australia. And I will finish with a, um, with just kind of some uh, a few comments about our region and the international efforts that are going on. 
And of course, it's an interesting thing, and I don't know about the Indonesian situation at the moment, but so much of um, regular healthcare has been overshadowed by COVID. And certainly the last few months have seen cervical screening in Australia be put on the back burner. Um, but it remains a significant um, global health issue. And we'll talk about that um, at the end of my presentation. So, um, wait a second, let me, I wanna see how to advance it now. Uh, I'm having trouble advancing. Uh, down arrow? Does down arrow yeah. work? Uh, okay. One yeah. second, I'm so sorry. Oh, okay, yes, maybe it's just a bit slow. Okay, so the way um, that I think we all are thinking about cervical cancer in 2020 is it's a preventable disease that was acknowledged by the World Health Organization as such in 2018. And we can talk about both primary prevention, which of course is HPV vaccination, and then secondary prevention, which is uh, cervical cancer screening. And we are incredibly fortunate in Australia, and that should be said right at the outset, that we should never forget how lucky we are that we have both programs. So we have a national HPV vaccination program and we have a national cervical screening program. Cervical cancer screening in Australia has a long history. Um, it's been going for over 60 years, and we are quite proud of the fact that it's been a very successful public health um, so, uh, prevention program. And for many of those years, it was really based on conventional pap smears. So it's really been around for a long time, but the first organized program we had was in 1991. And it was based, as I said, on cytology. Um, women were offered screening every two years. Uh, we did have what we called registers, which were collecting both cervical cytology and histology. One of the crucial things that we did in Australia uh, was recognise that it's not just doing the test. So it's whether it's an HPV test or it's a pap smear, to get a population screening program to work, it has to be a um, complex mix, if you like, of a whole lot of things. So it's recruitment, getting women into the program. You have to have a good sample. You have to have good quality assurance to make sure the test is working optimally. Then the um, abnormalities have to be managed. And you do need to continually monitor it and educate people as to what's going on. And of course, for any um, program these days, it has to be cost effective. And so all of those elements are really crucial to um, any screening program, whether it be for cervical disease, bowel disease, or whatever. But in Australia, we've seen um, a significant reduction in the incidence of cervical cancer during that time. Um, you can see that it pretty much flatlined. Um, and I mean, the reasons for that are quite interesting. But similarly, the mortality has also fallen significantly. And so it has become a much more manageable disease in, in Australia. So that's a picture of just the regular pap smear. But of course, during that time, not only did we um, reduce the incidence and reduce the mortality, a huge amount of knowledge has been developed about cervical cancer. And we know that it is a re disease related to human papillomavirus infection. We've got now the molecular fancy biology techniques that allow us to recognize the virus. We've got much better ways of um, screening and testing uh, for the disease. And so what Australia did um, over the last few years is really have a major review of the way we do cervical screening program. It was a broad scope. And it did highlight some issues. We did a good job, but there were certainly um, problems. One was getting women into the program. We have an indigenous population, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, and we didn't see the same benefits. And I'll talk to that in a moment. But of course, as I said, we've now got vaccination. We now about our HPV and we've got amazing technologies that allow HPV testing, um, all of which has really been developed in about the last 15 years. 
So here we have this great program of which we're very proud, but you can see that just getting women into the program is a big deal. Um, and we put a lot of time into working out why. The orange bars are the more recent um, period of time. And you can see it's fallen across all the different jurisdictions in Australia. All of those bars are the different, what we call states in Australia. And you can see that it's fallen. Um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are wonderful people. They're the indigenous culture, they're wonderful artists amongst many other things. But one of the um, telling kind of um, statistics is that the incidence of cervical cancer is literally more than twice uh, in our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as opposed to our non-Indigenous population. And the actual mortality is even greater. And that's because these women often present late uh, with the disease before um, appropriate management strategies can be implemented. Now we've known about this for a long time and it's been one of the worrying parts for those that have been working in this area to look at. Vaccination, of course, is the other um, big part of cervical cancer prevention. And once again, in Australia, we are so lucky to have had a program that was really started in 2007. It originally began with a schoolgirl cohort, um, 12 to 13. It's the first year of high school in Australia. And in the first few years, there was a catch up for the older women, extending really out mm -hmm. to age 26, and it's fully government funded. It was extended to boys in January of 2013. And again, it's a catch up program. We've had huge um, success in uptake. And one of the bars that I'd just like to show you there, this particular region has a very high indigenous population, our Northern Territory, a part that's closest to you, Indonesia, funnily enough. And a um, huge amount of effort has gone into vaccinating the indigenous population. So over 90% of the people have been vaccinated, which is a fantastic statistic. This is um, the take up in the male population and it's similarly been quite high as well. The effect of vaccination in terms of cervical cancer is going to take some years, but we actually have seen falling rates of the pre-invasive disease. It's quite measurable in all our statistics. So we're very confident that the vaccine will work. All of those numbers were based on the quadrivalent vaccine, but in 2018, as you can see there, we introduced a nine-valent vaccine, which has nine of the um, oncogenic subtypes. It's actually got seven of the oncogenic subtypes. There are two non-oncogenic, six and 11 in there, and I'm happy to talk about that later in question time, but it will actually prevent 90% of cervical cancer. And the other great thing about the nine valent vaccine is it probably can be done in a two dose schedule, not three dose um, for younger women. So that's again, a very optimistic um, vaccine that's available um, throughout the world. So our new program, which commenced as you can see there in 2017, um, it's a primary HPV, so it's based on testing for human papillomavirus. We've introduced what we call partial genotyping, which I'll show you in a minute. It commences at 25 years of age, and it, because of the increased sensitivity of HPV testing, it only can be done every five years. And we actually screen women quite um, out to 70 to 74. And of course, it's funded on our national health insurance scheme called Medicare. We also introduce self-testing for underscreened women, which I think is relevant to um, other countries, and I'll talk about that. And there was a big, there is a big focus on our Aboriginal women. Now, what do we mean by um, risk categories? Um, we talk about negative for someone being negative for human papillomavirus. They're considered to be at lower risk of disease and don't need to be screened for five years. You can actually subcategorize the HPVs into higher and lower risks. 16 and 18 are such high risk ones. And then there is another category as well. Now there's extremely good data to show this variation in human papillomavirus subtypes. And um, these studies are well published. All of the work that's done in Australia is underpinned by a big, um, it's on the, if you ever want to get, um, it's, it's available on the web and it underpins both the program and then how the women uh, in the program are managed. And there are complex algorithms, which I really won't go into about how it all works. Um, but in essence, if you are negative, you come back in five years. 
obviously, if it's any kind of positivity, women are then investigated further with cytopathy and colposcopy. Um, and I better just get rid of that. Okay. We also have looked at other parts of um, using um, cervical screening technology. And so for under 25, um, but there's also the self sampling, which I do want to talk about. And there are also women who present with symptoms and signs, and I won't go into that in any great detail. It's probably not all that relevant. We do have a new register, and that's because it's important that um, we know who's having the test getting women into the screening program is very important. And it does collect the information so we can look at how the program is going. It is designed for also for patient follow-up and to provide history for the clinicians and laboratories. And it really is designed to pull the whole program together. The one area I just wanna talk about really quickly is self-sampling. Um, that was introduced into Australia because of the concerns about recruitment and because it's trying to get women who won't screen under the normal circumstances. So it was very restricted. So it was for only women who hadn't screened for a regular basis. And it was also for women over the age of 30. It has to be done with a particular type of swab, as you can see there. Now, the swab wasn't actually validated by the manufacturers. So individual laboratories had to make sure that it worked. And that's what we did in our laboratory in Sydney. And the only reason I'm really showing you this is the fact that it actually shows that the self-collect was actually more sensitive than the physician collected sample. Now that particular finding has been replicated in many, many places around the world. And it really has meant that self-collect is being re-examined as a possible way of screening in all different jurisdictions. And it's something that may be acceptable even um, to the women all over the world. And uh, even in Indonesia, it may be something that may be considered. And I'll talk about um, Malaysia who has introduced that uh, or is introducing that later. So just looking at the monitoring aspect, just to show you how our screening program is going. Once again, you're probably sitting there saying, here's this wonderful program, but we still only have about half the women who are eligible for this program participating in Australia. Um, that's still about um, nearly 2 million people actually availed themselves of this in the new program. That's between the new screening ages of 20 to 74. So that was about that number of women, just so, you know, over just under 2 million actually had an HPV test. And just for your interest, there was about 8.7% positivity. There was the great majority of those were what we call the intermediate risk. And they are women who have the non really high oncogenic ones. They're the ones who aren't covered by the vaccine. And so it is also that the vaccine subtypes, the 16 and 18, were still prevalent, but at a much lower rate. Now, we also looked at data from our lab, which I'm going to share with you just to show that it's about the same. It's about 8% HPV positivity rate. In women who have symptoms or signs, it's much higher. Um, and that's also um, quite interesting. But I also wanted just to show you that the, the, it does vary with age. And so you have a much higher positivity rate in younger women. And there is a natural fall off, which is again, the natural history of the disease. But if you look at the vaccine types here, it's very flat. And it's really the other oncogenic subtypes, which are the ones that we're detecting in our program. So we've got this combination happening in Australia of both vaccination and also screening. Um, the higher risk groups, these are the women that are sent straight on to colposcopy. And the reason for showing you that is that in an HPV program, one of the issues, and it's certainly an issue for Australia, and it would be something for any country introducing a screening program, because the follow-up, the colposcopy rates are huge. And you can see again in the orange bar, how there's been significant women's being sent on to colposcopy in Australia because of the increased sensitivity um, of the test. And there, um, there has been quite concerns amongst um, many of the obstetricians and gynecologists about those rates. So just to finish, um, I do want to just look at the global elimination of cervical cancer. And you can see that it was actually 
uh, the World Director General, um, Dr. Tedros, who of course has been leading the World Health Organization through the COVID um, pandemic. And it was a big announcement and it was kind of, um, it's been sad that it has been a bit overshadowed because the World Health Organization really did take on cervical cancer as um, a major issue that they were looking at. And it was because of the understanding that this is really um, a vaccine, this is a preventable form of cancer. And so with prevention and early treatment, it can be cost effectively eliminated. Um, and you can see that the World Health Organization puts out lots and lots of statistics. And even in our region, in Melanesia, in Micronesia, there are quite high rates of both the incidence and mortality of this disease compared to what we see in Australia uh, and New Zealand. So how do you get a survival screening program? Um, a country needs to see the need for it and persuade the government to find funding if there is some for that region. And I do want to just share with you, this is a slide because um, we do, and I've worked with um, people from our region. This is from the country of Fiji. And this was at the Colposcopy Society meeting in Auckland. And this is one of her slides that she's given me permission to use. And of course, She's talking there about cervical cancer in Fiji and how she um, clearly put that it can be a surrogate marker for women's health generally and how a government may not see it as a significant issue for lack of resources um, and it becomes a socio and economic and cult the cultural realities of getting a cervical screening program off the ground as something that needs to be considered. A country that has actually undertaken... Two minutes, two minutes more, Ronavel. Okay, um, two more slides, um, just to show that Malaysia has undertaken it. They introduced a vaccination program in 2010 that you can see there. And they've recently introduced a self-sampling study um, called Project ROSE. So it is an optimistic time in this whole region and it is an optimistic time that we can prevent it. So thank you very much. And that's all I'd like to say. Okay. And I'm happy okay. to take questions later. Yeah, thank you very much. Very excellent talk, uh, Professor Annabelle. So we have three key words, three, three key important words. Yeah, XPV vaccinations, primary screening, and then manage effectively. Okay, I think yeah, we are really agree also in Indonesia still high burden for our government, the cervical cancer. Okay, we invite the second speaker. The second speaker, I will introduce uh, Dr. Andon Hestiantoro. He is the uh, staff of the Department of Surgery and Gynecology in Faculty of Medicine Universitas Indonesia. And also right now he's acting as a manager of venture cooperation and alumni relations in generally of Faculty of Medicine Universitas Indonesia. I think he's also my supervisor and my teacher as well. <laughs> he's graduate from Universitas Indonesia, has a lot of international training in in Netherlands in Amsterdam Brain Institute and Netherlands, Netherlands Brain Institute and also in uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany. I think it's a lot of uh, research and publication, international publication is already published by Dr. Andon in International Peer Review Journal. And also he is a former general secretary of POGI and right now is chairman of uh, scientific uh, field in, in, in POGI and also the council member of AOFOC and uh, Indonesian College of Obstetric and Gynecology. Dr. London, please, 20 minutes. And thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon all, for the all colleagues uh, at this moment. I would like to, to share my presentation. Yeah, visually you can you can see my okay. It's okay. Slide show. Okay. Can can you see my, my slide? Yes. Yeah. Slide so far, you go ahead. Good. Okay. Oh oh oh. Slide 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 show, please. Huh? Slide show. It's not slide show. Not slide show. Yeah. Oh wow oh, wow. Oh. Stop to the doctor. Okay, okay, okay. Uh -huh. Dr. Endon, press up the top 
It oh, says yeah. view options. You can tell you the size of the screen. <laughs> this one. Yeah. Okay. Which yes. is view option. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Okay. 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 Right. So uh, I would like this is my objectives at this moment. I would like to going to present uh, my presentation in that will be unique characteristics uh, of PCOS in Indonesia. So the objective of my presentation is, is uh, how we, we define uh, PCOS in Indonesia and what's the characteristics of this PCOS in Indonesia. And then uh, after the conclusion, I would like to introduce some topics for collaborative research between uh, Pogi and Rensko. So we have already known that uh, PCOS is a, a complex endocrine uh, disorders, uh, which is experienced uh, around five to ten percent uh, reproductive age women, and this um, syndrome occurring due to uh, synergistic uh, interaction between genetic, epigenetic, and environmental factors such as the diet and lifestyle factors. Uh, PCOS uh, is characterized by hyperandrogenism, chronic oligo or unovulation uh, status, the regular menstrual cycle, and also by means of ultrasound, we can observe the polycystic ovarian mor morphology. Uh, PCOS, uh, of course, the most common causes of infertility in women, and we can observe uh, the metabolic abnormalities often uh, associated with these syndromes, such as obesity, insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, and dyslipidemia. There are stress of evidence supporting low-grade chronic inflammation as a predisposing factor in women with this syndrome. In Indonesia, for uh, making a diagnosis of, of this PCOS, uh, we use a diagnostic criteria based on uh, modification or Rotterdam or revise Rotterdam 2003. But at this moment, we also try to also follow the new international guideline in IS 2012, uh, which is uh, also beside uh, uh, two of three criteria needed. We also identifying as some specific sub uh, phenotype. I would like to show you what's the unique characteristic of PCOS subjects in, in our hospital. We can see here almost around 25% uh, of our patient, of uh, our PCOS patient, show a normal and, and even show uh, underweight body mass index. Uh, of course, uh, all of the PCOS patient, they show uh, around 60%. 60% uh, in uh, BMI obese one and obese two, and also overweight comparing to non PCOS. Uh, if we try to focus on uh, the Ferryman Galloway score, it's uh, very interesting because we observe that our patient come with very with a very low prevalence with a hyperandrogenism uh, status. You can see here, if we try to compare it with other uh, ethnic in Asia, uh, they show a very high Ferryman Galloway score as a, a surrogate marker uh, for, uh, for indicator for hyper, uh, clinical hyperandrogenism. But based on our study, we observed that our Ferryman Galloway score, uh, which is in the associated with the uh, free androgen index more than 4.7, this is around five, not eight, uh, like uh, uh, other uh, participants, uh, other uh, doctor mentioned about uh, the, the hyperandrogenism. So we have our own uh, criteria for uh, Ferriman Galloway score. And if we focus on the the characteristics of PCOS phenotype, uh, we observe around 30% of uh, our PCOS patients showing uh, all of these uh, 
symptoms like hyperandrogenism, ovulatory disorder, and a polycystic ovary by means of ultrasound examination. And also around 44% they, they show uh, ovulatory dysfunction and also uh, polycystic ovary by mes uh, measuring uh, of uh, ultrasound. But uh, we only rare or very few patients showing the uh, hyperandrogenism and it's also very mild condition uh, uh, come to us around 20% and even with the uh, hyperandrogenism and then also with the uh, feature of uh, polycystic ovary by, by means of the sound is also around 5%. This is a very unique uh, PCOS phenotyping in Indonesia. And then the question whether we can ask whether our uh, lean PCOS also uh, suffering from the insulin resistance. Yes, indeed. We saw in a lean PCOS, uh, around 66% of uh, lean PCOS with insulin resistance, they have a very wide uh, waist circumference more than uh, 80 cent centimeters. It is indicating that probably there is a fat accumulation at the visceral uh, which are part of abdomen also uh, play a role uh, and associate with the inflammation process. Or, or, um, even though we can also observe around 30% uh, lean PCOS, PCOS patient with, uh, with circumference less than 80 centimeters show uh, uh, well, with insulin the system has so uh, less waste circumvention than 80%. I think uh, we need to elaborate more further what's the, the cause of factor involved uh, and the cause of this uh, insulin resistance in the very lean PCOS uh, patient. And we, we, we see whether what, what we need to know with the accumulation of the fat. Uh, normally, people use the BMI. But uh, based on our research, we observe that sometimes uh, we cannot use BMI uh, as a as a marker of, for knowing there is the accumulation of fat in, in the in the in the in the our patient. But based on our patient, we observe that the um, body fat uh, percentage or body body fat accumulation uh, is just more useful uh, in order to to know. Uh, in order to determine whether there is a association between this all of the accumulation uh, with the inflammation, even though in a in a, a non-obese PCOS. Uh, beside uh, the accumulation of fat, we also observe that nutrient factors also play a role. Uh, in the formation of lean PCOS in our hospital. For example, this is our study and then published in 2016. And then we observe even in the very low uh, body mass index, uh, they, they are uh, PCOS and some of them are, are insulin resistant. They show a very low level of the vitamin, vitamin D, 25 uh, hydroxy, uh, calcidiol. And also they, they have a very low intake of fiber, uh, and then they, they, they are deficiency for vitamin B6 and niacin. And then I would like to summary that in our patient, our PCOS patient, the accumulation of body fat, uh, especially the visceral fat, uh, may trigger pro-inflammatory reaction, and this is closely associated with the prevalence of insulin resistance and dyslipidemia in PCOS subjects. What about, the, what about the vitamin B6 deficiency? Since the, the plasma pyridoxal 5-phosphate that may act as a coenzyme for the production of cytokines and other polypeptide mediators during inflammatory pro -res response, it's, it's also may associated with the inflammation status in PCOS patient. Uh, in addition, the very low uh, vitamin D uh, and also low fiber intake may 
exacerbate inflammation, insulin resistance, and oscillatory disorder in our PCOS subject. Um, we try to, to look into the other micronutrient and also other protein and, and try to correlate whether there is a, a mRNA level of all of the insulin resistant uh, FU and PDR genes that probably may play a role in our PCOS patient. We try to look into the four uh, different anthropometric uh, PCOS patient and then uh, we observe the higher expression of uh, insulin, insulin receptors 1 mRNA, IRS1 mRNA, uh, observed higher in uh, obese PCOS patient. And it it's have a correlation, uh, positive correlation with the lower level of its HSBG, even in, in lean PCOS and also either in also in obese uh, PCOS. And then we also observe there is a gene polymorphism in FTO polymorphism, which is responsible for the fat accumulation. And then it's also observed in a lean PCOS patient. And we observe that the genetic factor, also there is the epigenetic factor of uh, play a role in our lean PCOS subject. For example, here there is a positive correlation uh, from DNA methylation at the promoter of androgen receptor, and with the correlation with the higher of pre testosterone level and also higher level of AMH. This is a uh, Interesting because the MS, AMH in PCOS is a really, really uh, important protein. Uh, this is uh, our study, uh, try to, to measure the MS. Indeed, there is a, a significant difference uh, uh, in level of AMH uh, comparing between a, a very mild uh, phenotype of uh, PCOS comparing to uh, a bit um, higher severe uh, PCOS phenotype. You can see there's a, a PCOS patient uh, with a phenotype hyperandrogenism with a, showing all of the three uh, symptoms, uh, hyperandrogenism, uh, ovulatory dysfunction, and uh, polycystic ovary. They, they have a higher level of MH. And in this higher level of MH also, uh, observe uh, a positive correlation and then they also uh, play a role uh, or with the uh, HOMA ER level. It seems that the high level of MH may induce the insulin resistance in PCOS patient, in particular in a, in a more severe phenotype of uh, PCOS. I would like to su summarize uh, our study. So based on our study, uh, increased expression of insulin resistant mRNA in PCOS, uh, in particular in PCOS with obesity, uh, is related to increased risk of metabolic syndrome in obese PCOS subjects. FTO gene polymorphism is positively correlated with the increased FTO mRNA expression in lean PCOS, uh, a condition that is in line with increased DNA a methylation at the promoter side of androgen receptor genes. Uh, it shows increased MH expression and also increased uh, free testosterone level in lean PCOS. This may explain the finding of positive correlation between EMH secretion and evidence of metabolic syndrome, in particular. Uh, Dr. Yoga. So I would like to conclude my presentation. In Indonesia, about 20 to 40 percent of subjects uh, are non obese, and PCOS in Indonesia exhibit minimal or mild symptoms of clinical hyperandrogenism with a Ferryman Galois score 5 as a cutoff point. The accumulation of body fat vitamin B6 deficiency, niacin deficiency, low vitamin D intake, and low fiber intake can trigger the occurrence of inflammatory process that affect the occurrence of insulin resistance and ovulation disorder in lean PCOS.
genetic and epigenetic disorder such as FTO gene polymorphism and DNA methylation of androgen promoter, increase and AMS expression and also free testosterone level in lean PCOS. And it may increase the evidence of metabolic syndrome in more severe phenotype PCOS. Uh, this is the subject subject that uh, I would like to introduce that probably need to be further investigated. I think we can do collaborative research between Foggy and Ranskops with two uh, main topic. Uh, first is epigenetic genetic inflammation and lean PCOS, and then the second probably we can uh, collaborate in assisted reproductive technology in PCOS subjects. That's that's all. Thank you very much to all of uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Andan. It's very, very excellent talk, giving a lot of new insights. We know that PCOS is a risk factor for chronic inflammations. So we can imagine that uh, we can imagine that if our PCOS patient get pregnant, how come, how risk, uh, how high the risk of having severe preeclampsia, for example. Very interesting, and it should be uh, further uh, uh, collaborated, of course, in, in research after that. And bef because we have a very limited time for Professor Annabelle should, uh, should leave the meeting at 1 p.m. So we have Q&A session right now for both, the, for both of the speakers, Dr. Andan and Professor Annabelle. So uh, please, uh, participant can submit the question into Q&A box. And for your information, right now, the, the, our meeting is already attended by 500 participants in the Zoom. So this is only fully occupied. And then we have 34 panelists. They are all the board member of POGI. And of course, some um, chair POGI Chabang uh, brands POGI from all of part of Indonesia. So we have six questions, six Q&A right now. I think we have three. We have three for uh, we have three for Professor Annabelle and three for Dr. London. So for Professor Annabelle, uh, the first question regarding uh, the parent awareness uh, to give vaccination to male student. How how is uh, the experience of Australia to convince the parents to give HPV vaccine to male student instead of female? This is the first question. Yeah. And, then this, and then the second question, in during the pandemic, how about the compliance uh, of the uh, people in Australia toward the HPV vaccine? Any, any in the compliance, any, uh, they, they, you did a lot of vaccination or you uh, get a lot of uh, loss of the vaccination. And then the third question from, for Professor Annabelle, uh, yeah, I, I think the same, almost the same with the, the first questions. Uh, asking your experience to convince the government and to convince the parents toward SPV faction for the boy. Please, Professor Annabelle. Okay, the, um, the, the whole vaccination has been dealt with very positively in Australia. I think it's largely because, as you know, it was um, Professor Ian Fraser was one of the developers of the vaccine. So right from the outset in 2007, it was um, seen very positively. I know other countries have had trouble promoting it. The, um, giving it to boys was something that um, was actually asked for. There was a lot of conversations about um, vaccinating boys. And I think it was um, easily, people were able to be convinced that it was um, a good thing to do because of uh, just the general concept of, 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 of reducing the rates of cervical cancer were a good thing. But also, too, there are other HPV-related diseases um, that in the head and neck and other issues like that. So I think it was genuinely seen as a good, um, as a good thing to do. As you can see, I did show it has a slightly lower uptake um, in boys. Um, it is voluntary, by the way. It, it um, obviously the young people have to get their parental permission. Um, but it's still over a 70% uptake 
And I think it's largely because there's a genuine society approach that it's a, actually such a good vaccine. It's an, it, it, it has been sold as an Australian uh, invention, if you like, and um, it's a genuinely good health um, outcome for, for the whole population. The, the, the next question about how has it happened, how has it been affected by the, um, the pandemic? Yes. It's interesting that the vaccines are usually given in the first couple of weeks of the school term. And in Australia, school starts um, 1st of February. Now, I, and, and then it's given, so I would imagine that there has, and in fact, the answer to that is in, in a word, I don't know. But we did close our schools for um, nearly two or three months, depending on what states, they, what jurisdictions were in. And I would imagine there may have been some disruption to that. I think given now that it isn't the nine valent that's being used um, in our screening program, that's the one where you actually only need two doses so they can be given a good six months apart. So, so there is some time for the catch up to happen at this stage. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Annabelle. So uh, we go to the Dr. Andons, uh, another two questions for Dr. Andons. The first question, is it any recommended to check thyroid panel on, on, on PCOS patient as a routine really, examination? And then the second question, for the PCOS patients, uh, will the lean PCOS patient more difficult to stimulate or is it any correlation with the androgen level or not? Yeah, this is two questions for the panel. Yes, Professor. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you very much, Professor Rico. Uh, whether we need to, to check the thyroid panel uh, based on uh, our clinical experience, I think we need to always to, to check whether there is still abnormality in a, this uh, a thyroid, a thyroid uh, condition. Uh, in, in especially if we observe the the uh, prolactin levels a bit higher, so we can we, we call it as a as a normal high level of prolactin. So we have to be co concerned or cautious whether there is a. a High, subclinical hypothyroidism. This is very important in the PCOS subjects. And the, the second question, whether uh, lean PCOS, lean PCOS also uh, have a more dif difficult to, to stimulate. Yes, in some patient, yes, because uh, because they uh, in especially in a patient showing uh, uh, hyperandrogens. Uh, uh, of ovarian dysfunction and also with the facial as uh, features, or they sometimes they, they have a very high level of MS, sometimes more than it, and it is it's a is it a, uh, difficult for us to grow the follicle if the the MS level is a high, especially if we try to uh, induce induce the ovulation with the clomiphene citrate. Uh, uh, if the level of MS is more than eight, probably is, uh, we can find difficulty to um, uh, stimulate this, this patient. Okay. That's Professor Rico. Thank you very much. And back to Professor Annabelle, you have three more questions. Uh, the first is about the efficacy of the vaccine. Uh, what is the efficacy of HPV vaccine for HPV positive persons? Uh, and, uh, and then the efficacy of HPV vaccine for patients more than 30 years old. Okay. Is it effective or not? And then the last, this is the question from the, our oncogynecologist, Dr. Yudi. Any different cost unit for women with and without HPV vaccinated for screening program? If yes, needed. okay, they're all very good questions, yeah. of course. And thank you very much for asking those. First up, the, um, the vaccination is, the word is it's not a therapeutic vaccine. So even if someone's HPV positive, it doesn't really help if you are HPV positive. In Australia, there is a lot of debate about the fact that if you have been treated for um, HPV related disease or so high grade disease, you don't have cancer, but you have one of the precancers. There is some discussion that it may help vaccinating people after they've been treated if they haven't been vaccinated before, because 
there's a range of different types. Remember in the vaccine, there are nine different subtypes. Seven of those are oncogenic. So you might have only had one of the subtypes causing the disease that you had. So there is some discussion about that. Of course, the interesting thing about that point of uh, that, that usage there is that that is that the patient would have to pay for that themselves. And so there is some benefit. It's not huge, um, but, you know, some people may choose to do that. And by the way, it's a similar discussion with the vaccination in women over the age of 50. Um, there's a, a couple of points about that is it, it's actually not licensed over the age of 50. And one of the interesting things about the vaccine is that it has a um, it is extremely it is an extremely efficacious vaccine in younger women. The um, all of the big studies, the antibody response is really huge when you've got um, a, like a, an um, not an immature, but when you've got a young immune system. So that's why vaccinating girls as young as 12 and 13 is considered to be so um, advantageous because you do get a very, very positive immune response and it is an antibody response. And, um, and, it, and at this stage, of course, we, um, we haven't seen those antibody levels fall. They still remain very high. So the vaccine itself is considered to be an extremely good vaccine. Over the age of 50, sad but true, your immune status does fall. Um, and so therefore it is not quite as um, you're not gonna get quite the same response. And in fact, it's not really, it's, up, it's really only licensed up until about the age of 45. I think the other thing to say is that over the age of 50, most women probably remember that over 80% of women have had human papillomavirus at some time. Most of them have got, um, they have been able to um, rid themselves with their own immune system. Um, so many women would have their own defense mechanisms uh, in place anyway. Um, and then the last question, which again is an extremely good question and thank you for asking it, is there a difference in screening between vaccinated and non-vaccinated? And of course, the reason why that's such an excellent question is that they were very much part of the consideration when Australia put in place its own HPV vaccination program and its own new HPV screening program. And because there is a difference, and, and I'm sorry, I, had to, I went through that quite quickly, but of course the data is showing um, the difference in age uh, related um, disease. But in essence, in Australia, it was decided to um, offer the same screening program to all women. And I think that was from a practical point of view. And I think it's one of those interesting things about when you put in a big program like a cervical screening program, you have to consider that, you know, you've got to make it to be workable for, for all the people involved. Um, and so, so that was very much, so it is, uh, and I know other countries have different screening programs for women under the age of 50 and over the age of 50. Um, but in Australia, we've just put it across the board five year screening. And you can see from um, also too, that if you remember that we still keep screening women right out into their 70s, which is really quite old. And, and by the way, we're still collecting all that data. We may adjust things as we go along. Um, it's, it's like a lot of things, you, you, you make your best estimate of how it should work and then you have to adjust as you go. Sorry to be a bit long-winded. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you very much, Professor Annabelle. And then also thank you very much for your excellent yeah. talk today to because you should and leave okay. at 1 p.m. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank, thank you so you. much thank and have much. a good day. Okay, bye-bye, bye. Okay, and then for Dr. Andon, there's some, uh, any other question? Even you have already answered in the box, but maybe it's very interesting about the 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 hijabber. So any relationship <laughs> between hijabber and vitamin D deficiency in PCOS, Dr. Andan? Yeah, perfectly. I thought so probably there is a difference uh, levels of, of vitamin D in women, uh, whether they they have uh, they they are hijabber or they are not hijabber. Mm -hmm. But uh, the result is there's no. Uh, difference between uh, for the level of vitamin D uh, between uh, hijabber and non hijabber so I think uh, uh, pro probably there, there are many, many factors that may cause a, a low level of vitamin D in uh, our PCS patient and also probably it's not related with uh, 
the exact level of it, have vitamin B, but also we need to go further whether also there is a difference in a uh, level of uh, receptor of vitamin B. That's what I said. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. London. So do you have any one short tips for our colleagues in daily practice of PCOS? In the yeah. Mean, uh, one shot. Like, and pro <laughs> yeah, yeah, our so patient, good. our patient is mostly uh, lean, lean, uh, lean patient, and I think uh, the formation of PCOS in our lean patient probably related with the lifestyle. So please uh, uh, do not do sedentary lifestyle, and probably the the nor nor normal, uh, nor normal conditions at the moment, <laughs> I think would would also help our PCOS patient becoming better. That's okay. it. Hopefully. Thank you very much, Dr. Andan. Again, You're thank you for, for your great contribution yeah. today. Yeah. Uh, have yeah. a great day. So yeah. I think we continue our sessions uh, this afternoon. We are going to listen about uh, Poggy Ranskok affiliation memberships. I think this is the very interesting initiative by uh, Dr. Vijay Roach and Professor uh, John Figos how yeah we can do it international affiliate membership what is the benefit what is the step-by-step -step process it will explain by sudi seka from uh, ranskok secretariat please sudi thank you professor weka and uh, good afternoon everyone it's an absolute privilege and pleasure to be presenting to you this afternoon um, i won't take up too much of your time because uh, i'm sure this is followed by even more interesting topics so um, as you're aware, um, Pogi Inokog and Ranskog signed an MOU. I thought I'll give you a quick snapshot of the timeline and the background. So we signed the MOU in May 2019, um, coincidentally just before I started at Ranskog. So I've been at Ranskog for over a year. Um, since then, we've had a few discussions with Pogi Inokog and Ranskog to, dis to discuss um, how we can collaborate, what sort of opportunities are available for all of us to work together. Um, after a fair bit of thought, uh, we had a chat in September 2019. We proposed to create an affiliate membership for Indonesian ONG specialists. Um, after a bit more discussion in May 2020, uh, we agreed to co-host a webinar with Pogi, uh, and we also agreed to launch the affiliate membership for Indonesian ONG specialists in this webinar. And as we're here, um, today is the webinar, and it's also the launch of this membership. Um, it's a very exciting opportunity. Uh, the key objectives of this membership are to facilitate collaboration, mutual learning and knowledge sharing across our organisations. Um, we would also like to create a range of engagement opportunities across multiple channels. Um, this event is a great example of how we can collaborate. Um, we would like to continue strengthening our relationships through building professional networks uh, and by encouraging peer-to-peer -peer engagement. Uh, and also we'd like to deliver tangible outcomes based on the scope of our memorandum of understanding. So we'd like to uh, put in place some tangible measures and, um, and move forward with it. Um, so just a quick snapshot of the membership and the associated benefits. Uh, the membership will provide you with a certificate of affiliation uh, affirming your membership status. This is renewed every year. Um, we will also provide you with access to electronic versions of our magazines and newsletters. So we have the ANSJOG, which is our scientific journal. Uh, we have the ONG magazine, which is our in-house publication. You will receive access to both of these. Um, and you will also receive access to our newsletter that uh, provides you with up-to-date news every week on what Ranskog is doing. Uh, and we will also work with POGI to include more information that is tailored to yourselves. Um, you will also have access to quality learning resources on our e-learning platform, Climate. Uh, we have a, a range of clinical and non-clinical topics that I'm sure you'll find very useful and engaging. Um, our ASM, which is our annual scientific meeting, is held every year. Um, it's very well attended. Uh, we average around 700 delegates each year. Uh, and as part of this membership, you will receive a significant discount to attend this meeting each year. Um, continuing on, uh, we will also provide discounted access to Ranskog events that we plan to deliver in Indonesia, and this will be done in collaboration with Pogi. Um, we will also attempt to engage ongoing through periodic webinars, podcasts, and social media. I think there are a lot of opportunities there for both colleges. 
Um, and we are constantly thinking of ways to improve this and we, we will give you priority access to any collaborations between POGI, Inacog and Ranskog um, as we develop new initiatives, as we develop new ideas, we will share this with you and we will keep you posted. Um, just some information regarding the membership. Um, it is Australian dollar 600 per year, renewable every June. Uh, the minimum requirements are current specialist registration and affiliation with POGI and Inacog. Um, validation will be done in collaboration with POGI. Uh, we'll make sure that all the documents are um, up to date and make sure that the mem members that apply for these memberships um, are vetted by POGI as well. Uh, and your point of contact will be the Ranskog membership team whose contact details I will share very shortly. Um, just in terms of the process, we will advertise a link to the membership and the membership form through the POGI Secretariat. I will work with the Secretariat to get this information out to you. The link will be open from tomorrow for registrations. Um, there are multiple stages to the registration with document validation and payment. So each stage will prompt an email that's sent to you uh, and it will provide you with information on how to proceed with uh, the next stage. Once all the stages and payment are completed, our membership team will be in contact with you to provide access to all the resources and to also provide you with set up instructions. Um, this is the contact details for our membership team. They will be a primary point of contact with any queries. Um, if you could include Indonesian affiliate membership in your subject line, excuse me, uh, that would be great. Um, I think this is a very exciting opportunity for all of us and uh, we are looking forward to welcoming you on board as affiliate members um, if you choose to go on that journey with us. Um, and we will make every effort to make this very valuable and uh, very engaging for all of you. Um, I would like to welcome some comments from uh, Dr. Roach, Professor Wabeko, um, and anyone else on screen that would like to add to this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Suri. It's very, very uh, uh, good opportunity for us as well. So as our goals in Indonesia, we'd like to improve, of course, the the competencies, the professional, the professionalism of all our member in Indonesia, as well as the international recognition with other organization in the world. So I think this is one of the, the milestone of uh, POGI programs. So any adding information from Vijay or from John, if he goes. I just wanted to encourage um, encourage all of you to join. And I think that one of the things that we talk about at Ranskog is that Ranskog is a family. And so we would like to have Indonesian brothers and sisters and Indonesian cousins as well and so in our family. And so we would very much encourage you to join. And, and I would like to um, take this opportunity to say that really the biggest reason that Ranskog is here um, is because of Professor John Svigos and uh, a meeting that he and I had more than two years ago uh, in which he, he talked to me about his relationship with Indonesia and his colleagues and encouraged me to, um, to contact Pogi and, uh, and, and, we, and the rest is history. So in fact, John, uh, I, I know you, you had, had, didn't have anything prepared, but I would like you to talk to the importance of uh, the membership of our Indonesian colleagues uh, uh, be, being members of Ranskog. Okay, please, Jan. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to say is that uh, I think uh, it's important uh, for the Australian uh, obstetricians and gynaecologists, Australian New Zealand obstetrician gynaecologists, our college, uh, to um, discover and find out the wonderful uh, social and sociable aspects of the Indonesian people and our own colleagues, and also the major problems that they confront, which are so different to ours. And I think that that's very humbling for us to see what such a great job that you all do over there in Indonesia with, with, you know, restricted um, uh, equipment, restricted uh, finance and so forth. And, and yet the same uh, emphasis on the patient care that we, we hold very dear in Australia is over there in Indonesia and it's very admirable. And so we find that, I find that, and I know the people that I take over to Indonesia with me each year 
find that very uplifting and, uh, and very humbling. It makes us feel very humble and that we have a lot to learn from you. And, uh, and I think as soon as we've made that very clear, then I think everything comes into being. We're not here to tell people what to do. We're here to learn from you. And then together, I'm sure we can come up with uh, strategies that will help uh, patients both in our country, because after all, you have experience in lots of conditions that we don't have. And look at us now, we're all sharing the common experience with COVID-19. Okay, we knew nothing about COVID-19. Didn't matter where, which country you were from. We just had to really find the best way that we could. And so being able to uh, speak to one another very quickly, uh, we can learn from each other's experience and perhaps help our patients, help our, help our populations. So from my point of view, it's all about friendliness. It's all about trust. It's all about uh, respect. And certainly we have that for our Indonesian colleagues. And I've had that given back to me many times, as have my colleagues that I've come that have come with Indone to Indonesia with me, have had that as well. And so we would love you to be part of our college. And, uh, and this is the only way that we know how to make you part of our college. And we would love to see you at our meetings. We'd love to see you participating. And I want to say to Professor, uh, um, sorry, to our last speaker, Dr. Andon, and, um, I want to congratulate him on his excellent English. That's very good. Okay, I was going to say, anda bahasa Inggris bagus. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, John. I appreciated that very much. So I know how much. difficult it is, uh, but you've done an excellent job. Of course, our Australian speakers are very good at their uh, specialty, and I hope that they can uh, give you the benefit of their experience. So we have other speakers to come. So I'll stop for now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, John. You, thank you. Thank you very much, Vijay. Uh, Dr. Ari Kusuma, you want to add something, some information? Pogi President, Dr. Ari or Dr. Yudi, as a president-elect regarding this uh, international affiliation membership. There is, there is one Dr. question Dr. from Dr. our member. Okay, please. Uh, I think thank you for this collaboration, this opportunity to uh, my members, for Indonesian members, to go to international. And um, thank you, Dr. Sudi. Thank you, Dr. Vijay and Prof. Figos, of course, okay. to give opportunity okay. to my members to give collaboration uh, between uh, Poggy and Ranskop. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. There is one short question for uh, uh, for Vijay from our member. Is it possible for us to have uh, uh, change uh, reciprocally in training for even for the resident and then training? And then also, is it is it possible for us to have practice to do the practice in Australia if become affiliation membership reciprocally also between also for Australia practice in Indonesia or Indonesian doctor practice to in practice in Australia? Is it possible or not? Uh, I don't. Uh, there's two two answers to your question. One is that th that that would not be that the membership and and the relationship in the MOU gives us an opportunity to discuss those <laughs> opportunities. So therefore, and we would very much like to see um, transfer of trainees and training opportunities in Indonesia for Australians and New Zealanders, and creating those opportunities for Indonesian doctors to come to Australia and New Zealand. But the being an international affiliate membership does not create that um, qualification. So the the membership is purely between the organisations, Ranskog and Pogi. It has nothing to do with clinical practice or the ability to practice in Australia or New Zealand. I think it'd be fair to say, VJ, that it would open up the dialogue for that potential. So if we've got two bodies that are talking to one another. Okay. then perhaps we might be able to work out. There's a lot of uh, administration that we have to go through in order for those sort of things to happen. But it would be something that we would at least have the opportunity to talk about. But we cannot make any promises. Okay. Okay. Yet. Okay. Thank you very much, Budi, uh, Budi, John Prof. Budi. Budi. Prof. Budi. Uh, yeah, Prof. Eri? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, please. Let me have one, one minute. One question. Yes, one yeah, question. To um, Prof. John Spigos. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hello, yes, Jerry. Yes, just um, 
it's very nice to listen to your offering for the uh, joint study that it remind me uh, to um, five years ago when yes. uh, Indonesian resident in Trini uh, stationed in uh, the Adelaide for phytometronal consultant. Yes, we have been there for two months. Yes, we right. had a rotation. Yes. Is it possible to be done now just for the uh, getting um, chance? Once again, we'll have to we'll have to establish the dialogue. What happened was that okay. the funding for that had stopped. The Australian government stopped the funding for that. And so we're not able to get that restored. How our budget is going to go post COVID-19, I just don't know yet, Harry. But there, there, there are areas that we can discuss, all right? I'd love to say yes, but uh, in actual fact, even before COVID-19, I was unable to secure the funding after two years we had of a rotation, if you remember, of the okay. maternal food and medicine okay. trainees okay. from Surabaya and yeah. uh, Malang ah. and Bali. Yeah. through Adelaide, yes. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Professor Eli and uh, John Figos. Pleasure. So we are really hope that many uh, Indonesians, uh, obstetrician and gynecologists now become international affiliation membership of RANSCOF after these uh, collaborations. I might okay. add, that, yeah, we have, okay. yeah, we, sorry. Okay, okay, we continue to the, to the third speakers in our session uh, this afternoon is also very, very interesting topics. Julie Hamblin, she will talk about uh, the changing phase of sexual and reproductive rights in Australia. I think we are very agree that uh, sexual and reproductive rights is becoming very, very important in all of regions if we talk about the reproduct uh, reproductive health. And Julie is, uh, has worked for more than 20 years as a lawyer and policy consultant in health, law, clinical risk, disability, and international development. And she's a former partner of uh, HWL approach. There's numerous uh, government and other advisory bodies in health sectors, including Australian Research Integrity Committee, and then in New South Wales Clinical Ethics Advisory Panels. I think she's interested in global health, having worked with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and other organization on project relating to public health and in SPOH in more than 20 countries in Asia, Pacific, Africa, and Eastern Europe. So we are the first ado, we invite Julie Hamblin. Uh, Julie, this is uh, time is yours for 20 minutes, please. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. It is really a pleasure to be here and it's very exciting to hear of the possibilities of collaboration between our two organisations. So um, this is a great opportunity to kick off that collaboration and, um, and I'm honoured to have the opportunity to talk to you today as well. So this is a little bit of a change of pace because as you saw, I'm, I'm not a clinician so I can't talk about the clinical aspects of reproductive health care. Um, but uh, I have worked on some of the legal and regulatory issues that are relevant to reproductive health for many years. Uh, and as it turns out in Australia, the legal and regulatory issues have been very much at the forefront of um, much of the concerns and the policy development around reproductive health care in recent years. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about those uh, this afternoon. I'm going to focus particularly on the law around abortion because that is where there has been a great deal of activity in Australia just over the last few years. Uh, but I'm very happy to, to talk about other issues in the Q&A if, uh, if there are other topics that people want to talk about. Could I have the next slide, please? So in, in my comments, I'll talk first of all about why the law has been important and, that, and, and what has been happening on the law reform front. I'll make some comments about how the reforms to abortion laws in Australia have affected access to reproductive health care here. I'm going to make a few comments uh, on the issues around medical abortion in Australia and the use of telehealth, particularly for medical abortion. And then I'll finish by just talking about some of the concerns that remain from a legal and regulatory perspective and which are still affecting uh, clinicians who perform abortions in Australia. 
Can I have the next slide, please? So I'm going to start with a little bit of history. And of course, Australia and Indonesia do have a, a shared history in one fundamentally important respect in that both our countries were originally colonised by a European power. And in our case, although we achieved independence from Britain a long time ago in 1901, uh, many of the things that we inherited from Britain have continued. And one of those was the legal system. So when we achieved independence in 1901, we mostly adopted the laws that were then in force in Britain. And at that time, British criminal law made it a crime for any person to perform an abortion. And it was also a crime for a woman to undergo an abortion. And these laws that we had inherited from England remained in force in almost every Australian state and territory for more than a century. And for many, many years beyond the time when England itself had modernized its own abortion laws. And that happened back in the 1960s. Can I have the next slide, please? And so the process of abortion law reform in Australia has actually been relatively recent. There was one state, South Australia, that, that changed its laws some time ago. That was back in 1969, and that was followed by the Northern Territory in 1974. But there was then very little happening in terms of abortion law reform in Australia for uh, 25 years or more. And so the remaining states in Australia still carried on with the original British laws that had made it a criminal offence to perform an abortion. And it's only in the last 20 years or so that the other states and territories have moved to decriminalise abortion. And in the larger states, it is really very recent. It, was, uh, it happened in Victoria in 2008, in Queensland in 2018, and in New South Wales, where I am in Sydney, only last year in 2019. So this is something that has, is a very recent development. It was a, a very controversial and difficult political issue in both uh, New South Wales and Queensland over the last couple of years. The, uh, the, the, uh, the statute that was, what was introduced into New South Wales Parliament uh, to reform our abortion laws ended up being um, the subject of the longest parliamentary debate in our history. Uh, because there uh, were so many aspects that were considered to be controversial. And so even though uh, the Australian public, by and large, in surveys, has always indicated strong support for access to safe and lawful abortion, there were very passionate views uh, in our parliament on both sides of the law reform debate. Um, However, in the end, the reforms have gone through. And so we now have the situation where in every Australian state and territory, uh, we have laws that permit lawful abortion in certain circumstances. And I'll talk in a moment about the, the outline and the legal framework that we now operate under for abortion in Australia. Um, but it's also worth making the point that the fact that abortion has been a criminal offence here until very recently has uh, and continues to have a significant impact on clinical practice. The majority of early trimester abortions in Australia have always been performed in the private sector uh, and they've been expensive. The, the cost to the patient has been at least $300 um, for very early abortions, often four or $500 and many times that for later term abortions. And so that has been a real constraint on access. There have been more limited training opportunities for junior doctors in the public sector because so much of the, um, of the clinical work around abortion has taken place in the private sector. And it's also meant that abortion services have not been well integrated into other gynecological care because they have tended to be separated out and performed in private abortion clinics. Can I have the next slide, please? So 
So I, I thought it might be interesting just to outline in, a, in a high level terms what we have ended up with as a result of all the legal reforms that have taken place in recent years. Um, the, the first point I need to emphasize is that um, the laws on abortion are a matter for state law, not for federal law. We have six states and two territories, so we have eight different sets of abortion laws in Australia and each state and territory regulates its abortion slightly differently. Um, but there are some common themes and the, the first point to emphasize is that abortions can mostly be lawfully performed with the consent of the woman until a specified point in the pregnancy and that depends upon which state or territory you're in. So it's, it's between 14 or 24 weeks and there are a variety of, of points in between that. And so up until that number of weeks, depending on which state or territory you're in, abortion now is more or less available uh, lawfully with the consent of the woman. There are a range of different provisions that govern later term abortions, but in almost every state and territory, they are generally lawful where they are certified to be appropriate having regard to the woman's circumstances. And so there are various legal requirements for a doctor to certify that the abortion is appropriate um, uh, and that would include circumstances where there is a serious fetal anomaly, where there would be some particular um, extreme social and economic hardship, there may be some, uh, some severe physical or mental illness that the mother is suffering from, um, which means that it would not be appropriate for the abortion to continue, for the pregnancy to continue, I'm sorry. So, so there are a variety of provisions around later term abortions, which are extremely rare in Australia, but uh, nonetheless, the law now recognises that there are some very limited circumstances where they can be performed. The right of conscientious objection is recognised and Australian law has al always recognised a right of conscientious objection for a doctor to refuse to perform any procedure that is contrary to his or her moral or religious values. And our abortion laws recognise that right of conscientious objection. But in most cases, they require the doctor to refer the patient on to another doctor or a health service where the abortion can be performed. So there's an attempt to find a balance between the doctor's uh, right of conscientious objection on the one hand, and the need to ensure that the patient is referred elsewhere for the health care that she is seeking. There are various other requirements in our laws around counselling obligations. Uh, in some states, there are uh, obligations to report uh, uh, abortions in a de-identified way to the government for monitoring. Uh, it, it ends up being quite a legally complex procedure. Uh, and it's probably fair to say that despite all the law reform, it still remains highly regulated and is probably still the most regulated procedure in Australia. The other significant change uh, legally in recent years has been that most states and territories now have laws preventing people from gathering outside clinics where uh, abortions are performed and harassing or intimidating women who are seeking an abortion. Uh, and that had been considered a very important provision in order to uh, protect the rights and interests of women who were seeking uh, an abortion. Could I have the next slide, please? I want to just make a few comments about medical abortion. I mean, interestingly, medical abortion has been relatively uncommon in Australia until recently compared with many other countries. So the abort abortion drugs were only approved for use here in 2006 in very limited circumstances. They really only became registered for wider use in 2012 and were funded by the government the following year. Um, and since then uptake has been relatively slow and that's probably due to a variety of reasons. There were additional training requirements, particularly for GPs who wanted to to uh, be licensed to prescribe medical abortion drugs. There has been, I think until recently, um, a lack of awareness on the part of Australian women about medical abortion as not been perhaps the same level of comfort about medical abortion as it has been about surgical abortion. 
there've been some insurance issues, particularly for GPs who have been charged additional insurance premiums uh, for performing abortions. Uh, and there have been some legal barriers, uh, particularly old laws that requ required abortions to be performed only in uh, hospitals and health facilities. And so some changes have been necessary in order to remove those legal barriers. And we are now seeing medical abortion uh, becoming more, more common and more accepted as an option to surgical abortion. One of the very interesting recent developments has been the development of protocols to deliver medical abortion mm -hmm. using telehealth consultations. Again, there were some legal um, barriers to that until recently, but it's, it's something that I think has enormous potential in Australia because as you know, we are very large. We have um, many people who live uh, in geographically remote areas and where access to all forms of health services is limited. And so the options of using telehealth to deliver medical abortion um, has something that's been has been welcomed. We had a, a one organisation that set up a not-for-profit service to to do that mm. and um, had a service review that was able to demonstrate mm. that telehealth can be used safely if there are proper protocols in place for uh, for working the workup pre-procedure and then for proper monitoring and backup if there are complications after the procedure. And so there have certainly been some um, uh, encouraging developments uh, around that. And as I say, the removal of those legal barriers in, with some of our recent law reform has opened up the possibility for expanded telehealth services. Can I have the last slide, please? So let me just finish by making some comments about what um, are some of the legal and regulatory concerns that still exist when we look at access to uh, sexual and reproductive health care in Australia. First, I, I think I really want to say that the concerns are many fewer than they are now than they were a decade ago because the legal position has been clarified um, and having abortion removed from the Crimes Act has meant that uh, the, the clinical focus can appropriately be brought back to the forefront. But the legacy of abortion having been a crime, I, I think is going to remain for some time. And there is still work to be done in order to, uh, in order to improve access to sexual and reproductive health services. It's certainly the case that access to abortion in the public sector is improving but removing the legal obstacle was only the first step. And so now there is still work to be done in building capabilities within the public health sector and uh, getting the training and the other aspects of service provision in place in order to enable that to happen. The fact that we still have an enormous number of regulatory differences between states and territories is problematic. The law is still enormously complex. As I said, it's, it's one of the most highly regulated medical procedures. There are still reports of women traveling between states for abortions because of different requirements. Uh, it might be lawful in one state up to a certain number of weeks. And if they are beyond that period, they may have to travel to get an abortion. So there are still some um, practical issues there that need to be addressed. Um, as I've said, I think more can be done to raise public awareness about medical abortion and getting protocols in place to uh, deliver that. Uh, more widely. And telehealth until recently remains underused as a means of promoting reproductive health care. Uh, and perhaps just to finish on a positive note, there isn't a great deal that we can look at that is positive coming out of COVID-19. But the one thing I think we can say is that it is showing all of us the opportunities of using technology better than we've done in the past. And in Australia, we're certainly seeing that with telehealth across a whole range of sectors. And I certainly believe that that is a, a real opportunity for us in terms of improving reproductive health care. So thank you. Those were my comments uh, and uh, I look forward to the further discussion. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Julie, for a very informative lecture. And then the next, uh, before Q&A, we are continuing to the last speaker for today. Uh, he is uh, Professor Eric Gumilar. Sorry. Yeah. 
uh, from Surabaya. I will let you know soon. Uh, yeah, Professor Eli Gumilar is a staff, mem staff member of the Department of Strategic and Gynecology, uh, Maternal and Fetal Medicines at University of Erlangga and Dr. Stomo General Hospital Surabaya. I think he's did, he did a lot of research and services in, in the field of uh, maternal and fetal medicine, as well as uh, international publication in some international uh, peer review journal. And also he's very active as a staff of International Society of Study of Hypertension in Pregnancy. Uh, Professor Gumlar will give a talk about uh, the preeclampsia situation in Indonesia. Professor Gumlar, time is yours, please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, Prof. Budi, <laughs> let me to have five minutes longer since uh, I have a lot of slides. Is it possible? 32 slides, but I'll be uh, faster. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> right? Okay, please. Just 15 minutes is very hard to do it. <laughs> okay, 20 minutes is possible, okay, right? 20 okay. minutes, yes. Right. It's okay, Buddy. It happens in all the lectures I'm with Professor Avery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Please, Prof. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, it's... Um... <clears throat> Thank you so much for all audience and um, Prof. Budi, Dr. Andons, and it just um, make me very fresh to meet you, uh, Prof. Spigos, <laughs> since it's a long time, handicapped by uh, uh, pandemic COVID-19, I think. But I miss going to Adelaide, just <laughs> visiting your town. So. Uh, I have some... Um, invitations to talk about a preeclampsia in Indonesia that um, we admit it is just a lot of burdens in our country and even just make the most possible cause of very high maternal mortality. So just overview, uh, I'll be try to um, cover all <clears throat> items here, but, but this again, it should be just maybe at 20 minutes, <laughs> I'll do this. Okay, preeclampsia, just we know just three until five percent. It is the hypertension and um, <clears throat> give some complicate to uh, <clears throat> maternal organs and intrauterine growth detections for <clears throat> the, the fetal. Then uh, the morbidity, of course. So <clears throat> every... Um, Patients by preeclampsia, just, uh, <clears throat> it consists of maternal organ dysfunction here. Just, of course, just definite by <clears throat> high blood pressure. I think just, um, we know well, if just the uh, <clears throat> systolic, at least 114, or just one or <clears throat> both of them um, diastolic. And um, maternal organ dysfunction here, just cerebral and visual symptoms. Uh, this in Indonesia is it's like the um, eclampsia, the, uh, <clears throat> the attack of seizure is, is not rare here. Proteinuria, and uh, I'll have another slide to show you just our <clears throat> another complicated preeclampsia in pulmonary edema. We still have a lot of the cases. And uh, hemolysis elevate liver enzyme and low platelet. I have uh, the uh, special slide. That are just um, I've been getting chance uh, besides my junior to get a PhD and talk about um, uh, acute fatty liver. There is the similarities of preeclampsia. It's like a help. <clears throat> uh, again, thank you once again, Prof. Redman, just <laughs> my beloved teacher from UK. It is your very old classic lecture. If just uh, we talk about a preeclampsia that are mainly for the, the type of early onset of preeclampsia, the um, pathogenesis started at uh, the level of um, uterine, uterine at uh, the spiral artery, 
you can see on the screen here that um, <clears throat> the uh, remodeling of spiral artery is not well here. So just briefly, uh, if uh, it doesn't happen with the normal, uh, briefly, um, <clears throat> partial constrictions of the blood, of the uh, facial blood here, and then uh, make it disturb for methanol adaptations, which should be 30% uh, of, um, <clears throat> of the um, blood volume increase. <clears throat> then uh, added the after the next phase of uh, after the failure of a remodeling, yes, we will see here oxidative stress and uh, endothelial deactivation dysfunction. Yes, it is uh, still uh, within uh, early trimester, started by approximately uh, week 10 of the pregnancy. Then after that, from here, what we call it like SDBM or just oxidative stress, just entering maternal circulations going to the maternal side. It is the, the placenta. We will see here the sensitive tropoblast and cytotropoblast that I'm comparing between the normal and a preeclampsia just look very different largely. That the placenta size will be going down at very small size compared to the healthy. And the vascularization just look very poor, then going so deep into a uterine wall. It is talk about the, <clears throat> the marker, right? So now it just has already been a practice, mainly in a developed country. But uh, we are in a developing country, just we are more focusing to, uh, to um, history taking or just from the uh, clinical appearance. Since again, the reason is um, it is the handicap for finance. We see here, just briefly, uh, the balance between a um, <clears throat> facial delayed and a facial contraction is uh, to be uh, dominated by S flip one. So that's why stand on this point, so we uh, will understand by the uh, facial contractions, the blood vessels will be uh, <clears throat> going up and uh, will be appear at uh, the week 20. And uh, this here, okay, just briefly, since <laughs> my, my slide is 32 number, I think. Okay, just uh, the journey of the disease, we can look first, second, and third trimester, right? This started here at the um, very early. Yeah. So that's why actually the disease can be prevented if we know well at the very early, right? That is, that is the step look very important here, what we call it early detection. And then started by week 20, clinical performance by high blood pressure and proteinuria and edane. Yes, we will get over there and then just entering the third trimester. So just again, the key explanation of this picture, right? We are as the clinicians and all the uh, health provider should be going to uh, upstream for the um, massive uh, characteristics and early detection. <clears throat> that is the predisposing women. If wants to be pregnant, we should be aware about it by getting high risk for the preeclampsia. Newly parity. We have a lot of the, the couple less than 20 years has, get, has been married. History of preeclampsia is very important too. Before grabbing the patients just by, by only short talk, yes, as asking her mom if there's any preeclampsia, right? If yes, just at least four time odd ratio, even just grandma, 2.5 odd ratio. Maternal age, over than 40 years, obese, chronic hypertension, and another background disease like chronic disease, and then vascular connective tissue, just like lupus. We have now just a lot of autoimmune disease that are much easier to develop to the preeclampsia. And uh, I'll show you this Indonesian's prevalence here that um, <clears throat> I'm not the chair of the National <clears throat> Petrometronals Association. It just uh, thank you to uh, <clears throat> all of my colleagues here that um, I can collect it from 11 tertiary care hospital 2016. We will see here that the um, 
preeclampsia, right? From a, <coughs> all teaching hospital <coughs> from Manado, Padang, Aceh, Palembang, Solo, Jogja, Bandung, Makassar, Jakarta, right? Very high here. Yeah. And you will see that preeclampsia divided into um, <coughs> late and early. And at the border is a week of 34. And here are risk factor in Indonesia. We are tropical and coastal countries. You can mention here anemia, obese, chronic hypertension, even immunologic disease. Uh, one paper <clears throat> we just incorporate to um, Professor Gus Decker. Just I hope that <laughs> we'll be listening to uh, this presentation. Just <clears throat> give a lot of contribute for the uh, launching the paper. Edema of pulmonary and preeclampsia. I think it's a lot of case we have. Yes, <clears throat> we see from the uh, comparing just by the year, right? 2013, 2014, even until now. And now just while the uh, COVID-19 has been rushing to the Howard's hospital, yes, we still have the classic problem of preeclampsia. That is what, what, what are the burden we have. <clears throat> uh, I'm talking about the at level of molecular data. I've already mentioned before, it started around the spiral artery, yeah? the leukocytes at the, the layer of endometrials. Yes, I'm directing uh, straightly the NK cell. The NK cell, the binding between NK cell and um, and cytotoboblasts in which the antigens call human leukocyte antigen C. So just this binding, if just the binding from the um, activating receptor from NK cell, it is positive. But in opposites, if negative receptors, the, the fate of the pregnancy will be disturbed. We see here in um, the graph, Right, we divide it into the sample from <clears throat> early onset and a late onset. Right, early, early just of course is more dangerous than late onset. Yes, that here we see just a lot of NK cell by a negative <clears throat> uh, receptor they have, so that's why it developed into preeclampsia. And here by uh, its E staining, hematocellin eosin staining we see that even in the uh, receptor of <clears throat> NK cell, the um, uh, inhibiting receptor of NK cell. We move to lupus, autoimmune disease, autoantibody. Antibodies should be hoped just to keep the host cell, but even just rushing to the cell make damage to host cell. That is autoantibody lupus. What is the relationship to uh, the preeclampsia? I can show you. This one in our <clears throat> study in a Dr. Stomo in Surabaya. Hello, it is clear my voice, Prof. Yes, 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 it's very clear. Okay, thank you. Since uh, I've been a grandfather <laughs> by seven grandchildren. <laughs> okay, so just, yes, you can, you can look across. here. The preeclampsia <clears throat> at uh, the blue color is, um, ranking at the second positions. So just if a uh, woman lupus becoming pregnant, be care, should be aware of it. Should be uh, the best one should before becoming pregnant. If uh, the woman lupus, right, within six months should be handled. Mom, if you cannot delay what a pregnancy and uh, make it the lupus be steady, that is much better. But if not, there is, the, uh, the journey of um, lupus women becoming pregnant, that the threat of preeclampsia which have been waiting. You have four minutes, Prof. Four minutes oh, more. I see. Okay, yeah. Now just I move to uh, another type, that cardiac disease on pregnant, right? What's the relationship to uh, preeclampsia? Look here, right? We have three types here, acquire, the uh, congenital, and then, another newcomer, postpartum cardiomyopathy. Acquired is um, like rheumatic heart disease. Congenital is like um, Eisenmenger syndrome. 
But the new one that in the old times is um, had been neglected, I can say, but now to be um, <laughs> the new star in our hospital, I think it's, I believe in another hospital in Indonesia having a, the same problem, cardiomyopathy. That, that is the pain diagram of aberrations. I wanted to say, uh, if the patients by CPR preeclampsia, yes, I can tell you shortly uh, there are two years collected cases, 30 cases from, uh, from cardiomyopathy, almost 80% who are getting or suffering preeclampsia. So, so the journey of CPR preeclampsia started at week 28, right? And then until uh, uh, after given birth to be another threat of um, cardiomyopathy. We try to, uh, to explain why does it happen here by two wrong just overlapping here that actually cardiomyopathy, right? Yes, it's like this one. T helper one produces cytokine, interferon gamma and IL-6, right? And then from the preeclampsia, we know anti-angiogenic as split one. Just according to another study, that the, the newest paper now, as split strongly suspected damage to the uh, cardiac cell. So that's one. <clears throat> okay, we move to um, another one is heme oxygenase one. This enzyme, yeah, uh, over last seven years, attracting the researcher since it's, it's like um, at the same level with asplit, the anti-angiogenic, asplit as endoglane, what's the call him oxygenase. One concept had already been over here, you can see from the screen, it's so expressions, yes, short layer, we can command is the protector, right? Just to uh, uphold the immune tolerance by increased Treg and uh, increase NK proliferations for activating, right? But then to um, develop placenta vascular development is needed for the uh, normal pregnant. That is the concept. But now what the results? In our study, yes, we are tropical and coastal country. The result just look is uh, confused. It's mm. not like the theory. There are no, uh, the conclusion no significant differentiates between the, the normals and the preeclampsia. This is a very attractive one. Maybe I just <laughs> invite you to make some discussion. <clears throat> Two okay. minutes, Prof. One? Yeah. Two minutes more. Two minutes. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then the acute fatty liver, right? Acute fatty liver is the burdens of. Um, the lack of enzyme <clears throat> for the um, the uh, LCD long chain of uh, fatty acids will disturb of the uh, methanol liver. Yeah, this one the data. Maybe I'll be, be faster. Give it already just five minutes later. <laughs> okay. The amazing one that uh, the fetal has. Um, key role for the acute fatty liver, right? What's that? That are the toxic metabolite entering the methanol circulation from the fetal and uh, give it the burdens for the mother. Okay, a little bit faster. Right. Yeah, now I just talk the um, <clears throat> methanol cardiovascular yeah, for early and onset, we know well just not only uh, during pregnancy, uh, but after given birth, the mother with preeclampsia will have another problems. I think you know well for the, this is our study five years after delivery, the cardiovascular race and the uh, metabolic syndrome. <clears throat> okay, we have another one experience here, magnesium intoxications. Since we are tertiary hospital, the patient refer from peripheral and uh, yes, some of them is, um, <clears throat> Not a thing about uh, the magnesium sulfate 
uh, dose and just as soon as arriving in our hospital, there's a look by intoxications. <clears throat> okay, just maybe uh, five slides, maybe I think five, the last five slides probably. Uh, now just, we know a COVID-19 effect, right? At my presentations two months ago, when um, the export shared, where's from Wuhan for the first time announcing French Smith's until now, there's no data, no evidence of intrauterine fetal infections. That's the science. Science just say it's the truth today, but the lion in the past time. <laughs> but what now, right? According to the latest paper now, right? The uh, receptor of COVID-19 just locate on a, what is the call the uh, ACE2, right? So by this explanations, yes, H2. And we know H2 just extending almost to um, the cell type here. So the big question arose, we are obstetricians, whether is exceeds at the placenta. Is it in a situ blast or cytotroblast, it's just exciting to make some study. We have 167 pregnancy by COVID infections. And then among them, 45 cases is preeclampsia. So just from the side of clinical performance, it is like preeclampsia-like syndrome. So what is, what is it connecting to uh, the um, molecular level here? I think from the... Um, the entry of these spirals over the receptor, that is maybe from this way, right? So just, uh, we now here been going by some ongoing proposal to, um, <clears throat> to give attention for preeclampsia-like syndrome. And they are, <clears throat> for the time being, we have two cases here. There are the baby by swab, swab is positive for PCR. Right, yeah, so just of course, this is um, we will uh, do a joint study with um, some very interest from uh, Oxford, yeah. Okay, thank you, Prabudi. Thank you, okay. so thank, just you. thank you very much. Thank questions. you very much, uh, Professor yeah. Eli Gunal. Very interesting, comprehensive lecture, and also comprehensive data from uh, Professor Eli and his group study regarding preeclampsia and also uh, several factors that it's related to severe preeclampsia. Okay, we have a couple minutes for Q&A right now. Uh, we have two questions for uh, Dr. For Julie, and then two questions for Professor Eril Gumilar. For Julie, Hamling first, it's very interesting question. So what is the minimum age for women having their ultimate reproductive right legally in Australia. For instance, for to be pregnant uh, or to decide whether she wants to go under abortion or not. So what is the minimum age? This is the first question for you. And then the second question is uh, surprisingly that abortion uh, regulation was just legalized in New South Wales only in 19, uh, 2019. So according to your expertise, what is actually the reason for Australian doctors in doing abortion or not doing abortions? So what is your uh, experience? Thank you, please, Julie. Thank you for those questions. And I, I know we're running short of time, so I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, the first question, it is indeed a very good question about the minimum legal age for a, a young woman seeking an abortion and when she can make her own decision. Unfortunately, there isn't one answer in Australia because, as I mentioned, um, we, ha we have that the law is different in each state and territory, so there are eight different legal regimes. But in general, the age at which any young person can do any legal procedure is but either 16 or 18, um, depending on where you live. And there is also a legal provision that says that if the young person is what we call a mature minor, so they are, are old enough to be able to understand the 
implications of the medical procedure that is proposed, and they might only be 14 or 15, um, then they are considered legally able to give their own consent. So those principles apply to abortions in the same way as they apply to any medical procedure. On the question of doctors choosing not to perform abortions, we actually don't have very good data in Australia about how, how many doctors choose to exercise a right of conscientious objection and why that is. Um, the number is small and, and anecdotally, the ones that I'm aware are all, all doctors who have a religious opposition to abortion. Uh, and that's why the decision was taken that the law should recognise the right of those doctors not to perform abortions if they choose not to, as long as they also refer the patient on to someone else who can provide them with the health care. Thank you. Any, any debate uh, between pro-choice and pro-life in Australia? A uh, huge debate and... Um, A different opinion. Yeah, different. Uh, I mentioned that the, um, the the parliamentary debate around abortion law reform in New South Wales was the longest debate in our parliament's history. Okay. Uh, and that was because there were such passionate views lining up on both sides. And the, the pro-life politicians were arguing with the pro-choice politicians. Okay. Okay, thank you. The next for Professor Eric Gumilars. Uh, the first question is, any uh, standard parameter for measuring S split one for each, each trimester of pregnancy? So allowing us to making early detection of uh, severe preeclampsia instead of using uh, protein urine. This is the first question. And then the second question, uh, based on your experience, so what is the ideal biomarker uh, to make uh, disruptive early detection and prevention of severe preeclampsia in Indonesia. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Just really um, exciting questions. Everyone will ask such a like this one. Uh, I'm personally just uh, honestly, uh, as the clinicians, right? What is my old beloved teacher? We are the clinicians should be just systematically from historic taking to just anamnestic then from this one, still press in my mind, even just can be a 70% contribute, there will be a preeclampsia, that is. And then after that, okay, we can complete it by the, what is the marker? The ratio PLGF and S split one within first trimester. But again, um, we are <clears throat> the country where just our brother and sister low social economic growth, right? They are get a lot of burden of maternal mortality from here. Of course, just theoretically or just finance aspect, it's very impossible to provide themselves by, by offering the, uh, the marker. Just again, it should be just a very simple one. And even the philosophy say uh, the disease can be prevented by just only uh, knowing themselves, just like newly para, and then history taking, and then and then so on. Then started by low dose aspirin and combined by calcium. But if just for the high educated patient, right, just need us to be a good counseling, it's okay. Now just we play to uh, the marker of the ratio PLGF and, and a split one. Until now, the papers say, uh, and at the journey of the pregnancy weeks, first trimester, second and third trimester, mainly we're focusing to the first trimester, this one. Since why? The ratio is needed largely from this point. And after crossing at the second half, I think yes, that is a, not a useful one. So just my short answer within the first trimester. Since why? We have another parameter here, for instance, make a Doppler velocimetry by uterine artery velocimetry will make completely. And then from the anamnestic and just from the body mass index or just from your side, Prof. maybe a history of intra IVF, for instance, <laughs> should be aware of the, the possible preclamation. That's all, Prof. Right? Okay. okay, thank you very much. I think uh, the last chance, 
we allow uh, one or two person to give direct comment directly or question directly to Professor Eri or to Julie Hamblin. Please, you can you can unmute yourself and then give comment or question directly. Please, anyone, maybe one or two person, or Vijay or John will give a comment regarding um, yeah. I'm gonna ask Eri. Eri, what about antiphospholipid syndrome? Uh, in uh, preeclampsia in Indonesia? Yeah, a lot of cases have syndrome. Yes, yep. lysis, elephant liver enzyme, and a low plate plate. And now just, um, so John, just our, our study just lasting uh, one week ago when uh, I went uh, besides my junior to be getting PhD from the acute fatty liver. So just the, the early pregnancy within the first half by a lot of complaint of vomiting and then bilirubinemia. One paper, I got it, that as split just going up. So just look here, the similarity of HAP syndrome and acute fatty liver. That is, yeah. Yeah, I was more looking for anti life and antibody and seeing whether or not that you might have had some data on that, but it doesn't matter. That's okay. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Anyone? Vijay, you want to add something? I, I wanted to ask you, you a question, Buri, which is um, what, what is the situation in Indonesia regarding uh, the provision of abortion? Is it uh, different to Australia and New Zealand? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, uh, uh, I think this uh, can help me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me to, uh, to give the answer yeah. first. That according, as long as I remember, by the law of 2017, the um, revise of our abortion law, there are two types of uh, patients can be done for the abortions. Number one, by the philosophy uh, to save the mother. For instance, pregnancy with a cardiac disease, for instance. We know well there's two sides by advance of pregnancy make it the cardiac disease to be uh, severe or just the uh, cardiac disease just threatening the pregnancy. By this reason, we can do it. And uh, number two, and now just uh, conjoined twin, for instance, right? A lot of cases we have. One month ago, we had a one case in our teaching hospital that a conjoined twin, right, by uh, uh, one heart. I think it's impossible to be a separate I think it's costly. Just stand on this point, so we can do it. So just since why the reason is if just we let the fetal just growing up, the theoretically is impossible. That is as long as I know. But the criteria is needed here. Abortion should be done at the teaching hospital at the level of tertiary hospitals, where some discipline is needed here, like the. Um, forensic discipline and a psychiatry and then the other <clears throat> discipline team. It's not only for the obstetricians. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Prof. Exactly. Budi, just your comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm agree. I think the second indication is non-fable pregnancy because of uh, severe congenital anomaly. So the yeah. baby is not uh, possible to live outside the body. So okay. maybe Prof. Maybe, got one. Yeah, yeah, the random, please. Uh, uh, I would like to address uh, one question to Julie. Uh, Julie, what's your op opinion whether the, the involvement of government-owned clinic instead of a private clinic okay. may protect uh, doctors uh, who carry out safe abortion in the first trimester uh, with, uh, for every indication? What, what do you think about that? I think I think the main concern here has been uh, when the law said that abortion was a crime, it was a problem for doctors whether they were carrying out the abortion in the in a public hospital or in the private clinic. The law didn't make that distinction. The, the main problem, I, I believe, with having uh, abortion provision mainly done in the private clinics has been one of cost and access. 
in that it has made it very uh, expensive and, and in some cases impossible for some women to, to achieve an abortion. And also, as I mentioned, we have many women living in rural areas that are quite a long way from the large, um, the large urban centres. And uh, again, if you don't have abortions available within the public health system that services those areas, then uh, we have had women travelling very long distances in order to access an abortion, and that is also a hardship for them too. Okay, okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Dr. Andan. Dr. Surya, maybe uh, I allow you. The, Dr. Surya is a president of uh, Obstetric, Social Obstetric and Gynecology uh, Association. Dr. Surya, we want to add something regarding the sexual reproductive health right? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay. For, uh, I think uh, that uh, our, our uh, responsibility for the uh, reproductive health uh, services, health services, uh, it becomes lower during this COVID-19, and I think everybody has the right to 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 do antenatal care through uh, telemedicine or something else, but. Uh, uh, every woman, every pregnant woman, must have their consultation for the for their pregnancy. Probably that's my 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 uh, opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Surya. I think we come to the end of the session today because already 12 minutes past 2 p.m. Before I conclude the session, uh, allow me to give some uh, important notes. Regarding the yeah, we have very very important message regarding the the treatment, the cervical prevention treatment, Australian experience, which is very very beautiful for us to learn and then to copying uh, the the policy for our country. And also, we learn a lot, we listen a lot about the specific feature of PCOS in Indonesian population from Dr. Landon, and then also the very interesting point of view of a sexual reproductive life from Julie. And the last uh, special feature for severe preeclampsia uh, among Indonesian population from Professor Ayel Gumilar. This is still high burden. You, you can, we can imagine 20% uh, prevalence of severe preeclampsia and then 7% uh, of pulmonary edema leading to maternal mortality up to two to 3%. And we also would like also to announce that in October 28 to 30 October 2020, Pogi will uh, hosting will host the digital our digital uh, first Pogi Congress conference our digital first Pogi conference that will be held in October between 28 to 30, and I'm sure also there will be a Ranskok session. Uh, during the meetings. So we invite all of you to come and to attend the, this digital conference. So the last, any, some message from presidents, uh, Dr. Ali or Vijay, before I close the sessions? No, I would um, just like to say thank you. Thank you so much for organizing this. Congratulations on an extraordinarily professional uh, uh, it's just been organ. I don't think Ranscock has ever done something to this level. This is really very, very impressive. And uh, so you inspire us to try to do the same at some time. And I'll I'll make my last effort and say, Selamat Tingal. <laughs> Thank you. From Dr. Ari, from Pogi. Dr. Ari. Dr. Ari Kusuma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Alright. Okay. Maybe Dr. Yudi. Dr. Yudi, my president-elect, you can. Okay. Dr. Yudi, please. Dr. Yudi, as the president-elect of Pogi, please, Dr. Yudi. Yeah. Dr. Yudi. Oh, maybe. Dr. Yudi, are you here? Are you there? Having lunch. <laughs> the Tari, maybe please. The Tari. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Vijay, Dr. Vigos, and. Sampai so, jumpa lagi. Sampai bertemu lagi. Prof. Budiweko for organize this meeting. Thank you from Eric Gumilar, Prof. Eri, Dr. Andon, Miss Julie, and so Dr. 
uh, so sorry can give something to uh, my your experience to this meeting to join conference it's very nice it's a good opportunity for the OBGN members in Indonesia thank you Prophet Budi thank you Dr. Ali and then we conclude this uh, webinar uh, conference today thank you very much for all the speakers for all the attendees here the organizing committee thank you Sarah Sudi for all your hard work and also Ulfa, Luis, Yoga, and I think Sarah. thank you for uh, to you all. See you in the next webinar congress. Thank and you. Please I'll join. Goodbye, goodbye. Thank you. See you. Bye. 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 Thanks, all speakers. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Yudi. Thank you, Prof. Iko. Thank you, Rajendra. Julie, Vijay, Dr. Randon, Dr. Dia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya, ya. Shoot. Alhamdulillah. Oh, kamu harusnya kamu dengar bapakmu tadi ngomong. Mana banding dengar semua itu? Hmm?